And you had told me it sound like, I told you it sound like Trayvon, because Trayvon have a kind of baby voice. You bring me? Okay. So the question is, well, who is screaming for help? It's not Trayvon, is it? And your answer, it could be Trayvon. And the question, you know his voice so well. Was that Trayvon Mark, was that Trayvon screaming for help or wasn't it? Your answer, it could be. Like I said, I don't know, but it could be. The dude sound kind of like Trayvon. Trayvon do got that soft voice and that baby voice sometimes. So it could be, I don't know, you know it's not. And that's the end of the quote. Mr. Jones, we just heard that back and forth that first gave you the inspiration to do this study. What is it, what's going on there? What's the misunderstanding that you hear in that? Well, so there are a number of things that I found interesting uh, watching this unfold on television. Uh, the first was the fact that she was very clearly speaking in what linguists refer to as African American English, which is a rule governed systematic dialect. Um, the second was the fact that her testimony or what she said in a deposition earlier was being ostensibly repeated back to her verbatim and used against her. And as I watched throughout the day, because she was on the stand for a very long time during the day, um, it became clear to me that they were using the transcription to challenge what she was saying and to challenge her credibility as a witness. But it wasn't entirely clear that the transcriptions were always accurate or even made sense in African American English or otherwise. And so uh, this was the, the man who is questioning her is Don West, and he is the uh, defense lawyer for George Zimmerman, who was found not guilty of having uh, in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin. So what is it? What what is Don West getting out of this? What is he? What is he able to turn around and by by, I guess misinterpreting what she is saying. Well, in this particular example, my understanding was that the jurors didn't even consider her testimony when they came to their decision, even though she'd been on the stand for hours uh, and was the last person to hear Trayvon Martin speaking. So in that particular instance, uh, one of the things that he was getting out of that was harming the credibility of the witness. And so how often do you think that this happens in trials? That's an excellent question, and at the moment, I don't have an answer, and I don't think anybody else has an answer for that. Um, the study that we recently did suggests that transcription accuracy may not be as high as uh, we usually expect it to be, and what we'd like to do is get a better idea of how widespread this kind of miscommunication or misunderstanding is. Let's talk about your study that you did with Philadelphia court reporters. And what, what did you learn about how they interpret the, the language of African Americans? We had 27 court reporters uh, who currently work in the, in the courts in Philadelphia. And we gave them 83 sentences spoken by uh, nine different speakers from North Philadelphia and West Philadelphia. And the sentences were regular, mundane, everyday speech. But they did have grammatical features of African-American English, and they were spoken by people who have African-American Philadelphia accents. And what we found is that they were not transcribed at the level of accuracy that we expect from court reporters. So they weren't transcribed at 95% accuracy. That seemed to be in part related to familiarity with the dialect 
and familiarity with the accents. What were some examples of phrases that, that were misinterpreted? Uh, so one example that really stood out to me was uh, he don't be in this neighborhood, which is uh, he don't be in this neighborhood. And that has a very specific meaning where the be marks habitual action. So he don't be in this neighborhood or he don't be in this neighborhood means he is not usually in this neighborhood. Um, that was transcribed multiple times by different court reporters as he'll be in this neighborhood, as in like he will be in this neighborhood. So it changes the meaning completely. And I noticed that in the list, the phrases from the test, there are a number of, of them that use double negatives in them, like nobody never say nothing, which means nobody yeah. ever says anything. So, uh, so how often is that the case, where there's a double negative and then they can't sort of flip it around in their heads? That's an interesting question because people did generally very well with just double negatives, but not great with double negatives when there was any other feature of African American English. Negation combined with uh, what's called negative auxiliary inversion led to a lot of confusion. So that would be like, don't nobody never say nothing to them. And that was interpreted as a command rather than as a statement So um, by a number of the, the court reporters. So it was... Um, Sometimes it would be transcribed correctly, but the paraphrase would be something like, do not tell them anything. Whereas the meaning is, nobody ever tells them anything. Mm -hmm. You, t you talk of th this as being a dialect recognized as a sy it's systemic, it's consistent, it's people yeah. use it uh, in the same way the grammar is used by, by people across the board in the same manner. So, But isn't there a view that this is just, just bad speaking, bad grammar, and that it shouldn't be taken seriously? Is that, is that part of the issue? I believe that's a huge part of the issue. So that view does exist. Um, that view is something that linguists have been fighting for decades. Very, very often the general public will um, hold beliefs uh, or language attitudes about African American English, that it's bad, that it's broken, that it's not systematic. And it's in part our job as linguists to challenge those and to correct those views. Um, so this is something that is pervasive, and it's also, it's also wrong. If this is the case for court reporters, and I understand in your study you also found that uh, black reporters or, or black stenographers were would mistranscribe this as well. So what, what are the consequences for people? First, I, I do think it's important that you pointed out that the black court reporters did not necessarily perform better than the white court reporters. But the, the consequences for people can be really, really wide-reaching. So what the court reporter transcribes becomes the official fact of throughout somebody's journey to the judicial system. For instance, depositions taken before trial can be admitted as evidence in cross-examination, as we heard at the beginning. But also, appeals are often decided based almost exclusively on procedure and on the transcripts. And so this is something that can really affect somebody at every stage of the process as they move through the judicial system. Very interesting. Mr. Jones, thank you. Thank you.